Hello, hello. Welcome to The Revolution Will Be live stream. This is your host, TK Coleman. I hope your week is going well. Um, I'm excited about today and today's guest, but before we get into it, let me remind you that every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we are coming at you live. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, we have TK's Two Cents. That's where I take a couple of tweets from the week, share a couple of thoughts, answer questions, and respond to comments. And on Wednesdays, the revolution will be live streamed. That is when Kamau and I sit down with a special guest, people who are doing interesting things in the world and life lessons that we can learn from their journey and their insights. So tune in every week, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, 12 p.m. Eastern time. All right, today's title is called The Power of Writing Your Own Story. And the guest is a fellow Coleman. No relation though. Someone on Twitter introduced us about a year ago and I've been following along ever since. And his work is very fascinating. I, I was reading an article about him in the Philadelphia Inquirer and um, they were talking about diversity in children's stories and how there are a lot of people out there, they pick up children's books and they don't see characters that look like them or their children. And there's this need in the marketplace for it, right? And so here's what Coleman had to say in this article and it's a quote that really captured my attention. He said, growing up, I was a big fan of Japanese comics, particularly MAGA. When the popular and long running MAGA Naruto ended, I had a dream about four kids creating their own ma uh, manga, not MAGA, manga, he's gonna get me for that. He thought, why not write my own stories about diverse characters and bring it into this next generation of storytelling? I'm always interested in talking to people that take ownership of the changes that need to happen in the world. Something that is a consistent theme on Revolution of One is when you look out into the world and you think to yourself, hey, somebody ought to do something about that. A question to ask yourself is, why not me? Maybe that somebody is you. And today we're gonna to talk with somebody who answered that question in the affirmative and said, hey, you know what? I'm gonna take ownership of writing the types of stories that I wanna read and that I want my children to read. So welcome to the live stream, author and entrepreneur, Chris Coleman. Chris, thanks for joining hey. us, brother. Man, thanks for having me. It's it's always great to meet a fellow Coleman. Um, when, when you hit me up, I was just like, is this my cousin? No, I, I never <laughs> met this man before, but who knows, who knows? Maybe we'll see each other at the family, uh, family brunch next time. I'm looking forward to it, brother. I'm looking forward to it. Man, there are so many different ways we could start. You got a lot of interesting stories and your life itself is an interesting story. And I think I want to start with that. Uh, you wrote this tweet that really caught my attention, man. And um, you sound like you got that got that Tyler Perry roadmap going. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I, I want to get into your background a little bit. Uh, this is a tweet you wrote that really inspired me. You said, Sometimes I'd be looking back to those moments when I was broken homeless and be thinking to myself, one, how did I even make it through? And two, those were some of the best times of my life. I, you you got to tell us what's going on, man. What, what, what's yeah. behind this tweet? For sure. Um, so something that I don't think a lot of people may remember about me because I've, I've been on the internet for, I don't know, like 10 years. Um, I used to have my own tech startup. And so um, I taught myself how to code back when I was at Howard University, uh, dropped out of college and, and moved to California. And so uh, I was originally living in San Diego and just working on this, this idea that I had called Savvy Swap. And so um, I documented my whole journey like on YouTube and I was writing blogs and stuff. And so I was able to raise some funding with my, my co-founder um, and that funding happened to be in the Bay Area. So. If anyone knows the Bay, it's it's expensive to live out there. Um, and these these uh, programs, you usually don't get the money till the end of the program. Um, so the whole time while you're out there, you have to, you know, make your own means. So for me, um, I, I don't I didn't have any money. Um, so I was kind of like living in the office, but like nobody really knew. Um, and I had like I had three jobs. I was working at the movie theater uh, out there. I was writing articles online for $5 um, and I was building websites. I was just hustling as much as I can, but I didn't really truly have like a place to go lay my head because the apartment I had, I didn't pay rent and the landlord was always looking for me. Um, 
but somehow like the people that I met working at the movies or just the people I met in, in, in the Bay, um, I was always able to do something. So I, I never had a reason to go home. Uh, I never had a reason to feel hungry, even though I didn't have any money. Like I just had everything I needed. And, um, it was like fun looking back, like what? I would never live like that now. Uh, but like, those were just some of the best times of my life. And, and that kind of transition when I moved to LA, same thing. I worked at Buzzfeed um, and I went out there with nothing in, in my pockets. And like, it was the same thing. I would stay in Starbucks or I stay in the office as late as possible. Um, and just the people I met, I never had a reason to go home. So yeah, that that that's all the tweet was just looking back in these COVID times, like, man, I'm, I'm thankful for the roof over my head, but like, those moments made me appreciate the simpleness of being able to sleep and, and, and knowing you good. That's so interesting that you would describe this as fun in any shape, form or capacity, because I think the fear of being homeless is, is, is maybe the ultimate fear when it comes to right. dreams, right? Most people don't have right. dreams that they feel are going to physically kill them. You know, if I, if I right. want to go to Nashville and be a musician, if I want to start up a business, most people don't feel like, you know, they can, they're can they going to be physically die because of it. But it's that fear of being homeless, the the sense of social shame that comes with it, right. the insecurity of not knowing where the next meal is going to come from. How in the world, how in the world were you able to have fun during that time? And how, and how the heck were you able to get work and come up with answers to those mm. crucial questions, man? Because you couldn't sleep in nah. Starbucks, right? Right. No. Um, so, well, technically you can, uh, depending <laughs> on the Starbucks, because they're, they're 24 seven. So like in the Bay, everyone at that time, this was, I feel like kind of doing the entrepreneurship boom, like everyone would be in there working on their stuff and like people would fall asleep. Um, so that was like one thing. Also gyms were 24 seven. So I, I got a membership at Planet Fitness. So that's where I would like shower, uh, and stuff like that. Um, but you just get really creative and, and, and really unique. Um, and it, for me, it took me learning like a skill set. So learning how to code and, and build websites allowed me to make, uh, you know, some profit. And I just needed money quickly. So I was charging like $200 for like a full blown website. Um, and then writing those articles, like I'm already in the Starbucks. Um, so to just go through and, and write articles for $5, which I laugh at now, but I just needed the bread. Um, so for me, I, I knew I always had a skill to keep some money in my pocket. So uh, uh, sometimes I would get an Airbnb for a night um, or something like that. But like, I was never worried in that sense because I knew I had a talent. It was just a matter of getting myself out there so that people knew that this talent was available, that I was available, that I even existed. Um, and, and thanks to social media, like I was able to do that, which was a, a complete blessing. Man, I, I have so many just feelings just hearing that story, right? Just knowing that you were homeless. I think myself just even trying to put myself in those shoes, I, I feel anxious talking about it. Like that that is that is such a heavy burden to carry and to continue to create, like TK said. It, I mean, it's just mind blowing. And and you know, you you hear people put so much importance on good sleep, on good rest. How did you continue to come up and, and to work and to create and to be innovative without getting good rest, like on a right. nightly basis? Um, I like to shout out Ryan, Ryan Leslie. Uh, I watched an interview of his and he was saying, you know, he only he trains his body to sleep four hours uh, a day. And so I think half of it was because I was young. I was 20, 21, 22 around that age where like you can still do the impossible and wake up the next day like no nah, I'm, I'm good to go now being on the close to 30 side i don't think i have that in me no more but um i kind of just train my body like yo you only need four hours of sleep and if you get that like you'll be good for the rest of the day um another component of that is that you know my parents and my grandparents did a really good job uh when when i was growing up with my siblings of just teaching like positive mindset, uh, making affirmations. So I, I truly think that was another factor of like, yo, like today's a new day um, to go out and attack it and, and, and find that next opportunity, find that next thing that's going to get me out of this situation. 
So that was the only thing keeping me going was like, I got those four hours and then just the mindset to like continue to go and find that next meeting, write that next article, build that next website. Um, I was just doing anything to, you know, stay sustainable and and, and life. Mm. You know, I think a lot of people when they're approaching hard times or they see a mountain that they have to climb, they the the hope of reaching the top is what allows them to climb. You know, what, what allows yeah. them to get that motivation to to keep their legs moving or or to start the journey in general. But when you kind of jumped off the porch and you moved out to LA or you moved out to SF and you you really didn't know what the top of the mountain looked like. How did you get will yourself to do that? How did you will yourself to you know, endure being homeless without knowing the mountain's actually going to look like for you. Right. Um, honestly, that's that's just always been my personality. Um, I, I transferred to seven different colleges, right? Um, and that's a story within itself. But just literally almost every year, I would be going to a new place where I didn't really know anybody. And to try to make friends in college coming in as a as a sophomore or junior, it's kind of like being a freshman in high school. Like, you know, no one, everyone kind of has their cliques already. Um, but I don't know that that's always been exciting to me, just jumping in into the deep end uh, and just figuring it out. So like that was, that's always been my mindset. So I would never feared uh, going and doing my own thing um, and just figuring it out. I'm not sure where I got that from, maybe because I'm a middle child and uh, we feel neglected. I'm joking. Um, but I don't know. I, that's just always been my my thing of just like, yo, I'm going to figure it out regardless of what situations are in my way. And once I get to this next mountaintop, you look up and you see another one. And it's like, well, if I've climbed that far, you know, I can go a little further. Man. All right. So before my next question. I know you're from Philadelphia because I read about that in the yeah. article. The 76ers got knocked out a couple of weeks ago. And 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 I know you lived in LA. The Clippers went down last night. So I just want to make sure, you know, yeah. how, how everybody doing over there. Um, you know, I've kind of become a Heat fan because, you know, Jimmy Butler was a Sixer and I'm now gonna say I follow him, but it was it, it was <laughs> tough. Um being a Sixers fan, we felt we had everything, you know, we we're paying guys what, a quarter of a billion dollars to play basketball, four people, four human beings. So I thought we were going to get a little further, but um, I'm, I'm hoping we get a good coach. And uh, the Clippers, uh, never been a fan. I'm, I'm, I'm riding to the, with the Sixers all day, so all day. Yeah, I saw Magic Johnson uh, put up a tweet last night where he said something to the effect of um, the, uh, L.A. will always be a Laker city. I was just like, oh, oh man. <laughs> that was brutal. You think that's true? When I was when I was, uh, when I was leaving, I used to live in Inglewood, and they were starting to you know have those talks that the Rams were coming. And now that they have both of the teams, it's just like, I mean, that's cool. But LA people, it's, it's Laker Nation all day. It's Laker Nation it's a culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Well, well, I'm from Chicago, and and you know Jimmy Butler is near and dear to my heart. It broke. It broke my heart when we let Derrick Rose go and broke up the team. But um, I'm loving on Miami as well. Like, I, I, I really appreciate how Jimmy Butler pretty much just decided that he was going to be an all-star. I, I feel like some yeah. all-stars are chosen by God. And then there are some guys that's like, well, screw it. I'm just going to be an all-star. Yeah. And Jimmy Butler is one of those guys, man. But, um, yeah, he's, okay, so he's never been okay. the person on this. I was going to say he's never been the best person on his team skill-wise, but I think he works mm -hmm. harder than everybody else. Yep, absolutely. All right, I, I want to go from the part of your story where you're homeless, but you are hustling. You got a couple of skill sets that's keeping your head above water. Where does the being a children's author come in? Because you talked about at that point, you're programming, building websites and stuff like that. When did you develop this skill? And, and when did you see the light and say, hey, man, I, I think I can do this for a living. Right. Um, oof, probably eight or 10 years ago now, um, mm. when literally Naruto was ending, um, I'm glad you read this stuff, manga. Uh, 
Naruto was was ending, <laughs> and um, I was like, oh, like I was really I was really torn up about it. Like, ah, this is tough. Granted, I didn't know they had like another story about his son ready to go, uh, but I I was wondering like what happens when something that someone loves ends and like someone decides to create something of their own. And legit, I had a dream about this story. Like the whole story played out in my dream. And so I just woke up in the middle of the night and just started writing it. And before I know it, I had like a 80,000 word like novel. And um, for the longest, it sat on the shelf because I was just like, well, one, I don't even know how to publish a book. It, it wasn't as easy as it is now. Uh, two, I'm not an editor, so I can't edit this book. And then three, um, that I don't even know what to do, like in general. Uh, so I, it just sat for about three years. And then um, I, I think I watched, and maybe I watched a movie or something like that. Uh, and it was really cool about superheroes and kids, but it was like no black people in it. And I was just like, my characters are always, already diverse. I can take this same story and make it for children. Uh, and I only need to write 32 pages. So I, I did that made it for kids, figured out like how to get it um, illustrated, and then the process for publishing. And uh, I, I produced and released the book. And then kind of from there, I was just like, I want to continue doing this. Um, and I wasn't looking to make money off of it initially. But now I'm just like, all right, I want to be able to write great stories, um, share amazing information that people may not know, and also get paid, um, just like any other profession does. And for a while, you were doing this as a as a a really dedicated side hustle, and, right, and then yeah. you wrote an article on Medium where you were like, "Okay, y'all, I'm taking a leap. I'm going to do this full time." What what was it that catapulted that leap? Uh, COVID. Um, you know, mm. it, for years I've always I've been an entrepreneur. I haven't necessarily worked a, a real job in in a while. I think BuzzFeed was my last like job at a corporation. Um, but I was always creating for other people. And I was always, um, you know, doing all the things that I would need to do for my books for other businesses and helping them grow and make money. Um, and I was just like, yo, like, truly COVID, no one saw that coming. And the amount of people that lost their lives that never thought probably die from something like this. Uh, I was just like, this, this is a sign for me that I just got to go in. Um, and also, we had a lot of downtime. We couldn't leave the house. So. I have all these yeah. books that have been on the shelf that I was just like, yo, just just do it. This, this is a beautiful time writer. Just go for it. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, I, I mean, I got two questions. I got a lot of questions actually that are spinning from a couple of different topics we've talked about. But I think one of them is, you know, you seem like you were somebody who was really into Naruto, right? And you were you were a, you were a consumer. You just uh, enjoyed. Uh, the story you enjoyed, you know, um, the show you, you just you just enjoyed consuming, and I think a lot of people can relate to that. You know, having favorite shows, you know, having favorite artists, um, enjoying consuming content, right, and being a fan. What does the switch look like from being a fan to being a creator? Like, w w how did you empower yourself to create? Because I think a lot of people have hesitation about creating right they're like i i can't do that i'm not a professional um i'm just you know find my favorite shows and wait till they come out and just and just consume so how did you kind of empower yourself to to create right uh if i if i have to break it go down going backwards um the consumer is probably the best audience that knows what that niche wants so, like, for example, every a lot of people that watch manga go to these uh, conventions, um, goes to, like, there's groups online on Reddit or Twitter or Instagram, whatever, and everyone speaks the same language. So if that's something you like, um, you already know how to create it in a sense of what people would like. It's now just learning the skill sets or learning the tools necessary to, to make it a reality. Uh, so for me, I started with the basics, right? Um, I used to make vines, and that's where I really got started. I would make vines in terms of how it got into writing. I would make vines, and you, all you needed was this. The tools were there. You just had to learn how to do it. 
And then from there, um, I saw BuzzFeed was popping and they were using Facebook. So I had never used a real camera before, but I sent the audition video in using my computer and just the style of video that I, I saw them creating. And then I just watched every single one that was like that to learn how to edit it like that. Once I got there, I learned the skill sets necessary to make that kind of viral content. And I put that in my tool bag and moved on. So I, to answer your question, I think it just starts with what's the simplest step that you can take towards that big goal? You know, everyone wants to be a Tyler Perry where you have your own production studio and you own hundreds of millions of acres of land. But if you go back to the niche of it, like this man started in probably like community centers, rec centers, and then moved to churches. Like he took the smallest possible step to go forward. Um, and I think if you have a smartphone, that is the basic for anything you want to do, whether it's writing, beauty, um, mechanical engineering, like whatever you want to do, like it's all on the internet and you can literally watch someone document their process on YouTube or uh, Facebook. So take that small step, whatever that possibly could be. It could be a blog. It could be blogging. It could be, I don't know, you're taking phones apart, old phones apart. Whatever you want to truly be is just take the smallest step. So hopefully that, mm. that answers that part of the question. Yeah, definitely. And I want to go back a, a little bit to our, our basketball conversation and inject some of my bias in here. I'm a Lakers <laughs> fan. I grew up in L.A. Um, I love Kobe Bryant. I, I learned to love Kobe Bryant, I think, for what he did on the court. Um, his winning mentality, the championships that he brought to our team. But it was really cool seeing him transition post-basketball into this storytelling phase where he started to get into animation. And he started to get into writing children's books. And, you know, he even went on to, to win an Oscar. So right. I, I, I'd like you to share, you know, growing up in L.A., being around basketball, but also witnessing this ascension what did Kobe Bryant's legacy mean to you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, Kobe's originally from Philly. Uh, we didn't claim him early in, in, in his career because he says some things about us. But um, I didn't like him as a player. Um, and I didn't like him as a person growing up. But as I get older, you just have to appreciate the work that he puts into his craft. You may not like his, his personality. You may not like his character. But every day this man shows up. And once again, he takes the smallest possible step. If you watch any of the stories that these people talk about him or share about him, it's always like for three hours, he worked on the same move for three hours. And that's all he did. He used that move. So I think it's a the reason he was able to transition into other things so quickly is because he worked at the smallest step possible. And once you get that step, you build upon it. So you look first, learn how to write a script. Okay, I know how to write a script. I know how to edit it. Now, how do I bring the actors to life? Okay, I have to go to a hiring process. And he also surrounded himself with really amazing people that are good at what they do. Um, so that was the things I took away. Like for me, Mamba mentality is just an insane drive to get better at whatever you want to do. And then perfecting that craft to where you're undeniably the best or at least the best version of you. And, and you are happy with that. So. Chris, let's talk about the blackness. Yeah. <laughs> let's talk about the blackness, man. I'm, I'm super passionate about creativity and entrepreneurship as the means by which we exercise our power and make our voices right. heard. So many discussions on things like diversity, uh, black success tend to get reduced to political debates that, that require other people to agree with my narrative or our narrative. And then hopefully if we get a sufficient amount of people to agree then they will do something that will make us more included. And it right. always inspires me when I see somebody that says, hey, look, I'm not about to wait for the publishing industry to change because 
in order for the publishing industry to change, people like me need to be involved. And right. I'm, I'm really impressed with the fact that you just almost casually was like, hey, I don't see me in the stories. Okay, I'm gonna write my own. How, how, do, how do we get more people to develop the sense of confidence and creativity to adopt that mindset, to, to see these sorts of things as possible for themselves? Because like you said, if we don't see ourselves in the story, it might be a little bit harder to believe that we can create that right. kind of story. So it's kind of a chicken and egg sort of problem. How, how do we create change? Um, I think it's twofold, right? Um, once again, I, I think I'm blessed in the fact that my grandparents and, and parents instilled in me uh, Black history. Uh, so fun fact about me, my grandparents actually started a school uh, in the 50s, 60s um, to educate black and brown children in Philadelphia during the segregated times. Um, and their whole goal was to give them a quality education that taught them reading, writing, I mean, reading, writing, math, and African-American history. Uh, and so I went to that school, K through eight. Um, it was in existence for almost 50 years. It was at the time the longest uh, running uh, K through eight African-American school in the country. And so I really learned about people outside of Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks. Um, there's so many names that like you don't know that impacted where we are today. And so I think by looking at the past, you can find some really amazing figures like uh, Harry Box Brown. Uh, the fact that this man, to get his freedom, shipped himself across the country to gain freedom. If that's not an amazing story, like I don't know what is. It sounds like a Hollywood movie, straight up. This man shipped himself to gain freedom. Uh, so looking, being able to know my history and know the amazing people that have impacted our society gave me that confidence when I went out into the world. The second part was um, understanding and realizing that though some people may perceive my blackness as a threat, like that's, that's my secret power. Um, I used mm. to work at a bank and, and I always wanted to get braids and they would like people told me like, hey, like you have to have this certain look to work at a bank. And so I cut my hair off, like I, I did the whole like trick and pony. And once I realized like the customers love me cause I was cool, cause I was myself. I'm just like, yo, like they truly love the black part of me but you gotta suppress it a little bit. Um, and, it, and it wasn't until like the last few years that I felt like, you know, I could really be my, my full authentic black self. And, I still put my black voice, I mean, my, you know, my, my white voice on when I'm on certain phone calls, but I think it's, it's just uh, us feeling like, hey, I'm, I'm cool in my own skin and I'm just going, you know, wear it out into the world. And I think as we do that and as more people are getting in positions of power um, and we actually have more dollars to be able to use, like a Tyler Perry or um, Issa Rae or... It's like the, this whole shift that's happening, this whole paradigm that's happening, I think people are going to become more comfortable uh, being their authentic selves, telling their authentic stories, and just fully engaging um, and showing up. Yeah, you know, one of the things I love about the part where you were saying you just owned who you were, how you wanted to wear your hair, is you see a lot of people in the professional world who they have a way that they want to be. They have a way they want to live their lives, but then they're, they're, they're dominated by this fear of, oh, but what if the company, what if a company doesn't want to hire me? So this would come up for me a lot when I would talk about college alternatives. People would often say, hey, you know, I would rather do an apprenticeship. I don't want to go to college. I'd rather go to a coding boot camp or do something like that. But, right. you know, what if there's a job that won't take me seriously, you know, even though I have these skills without a degree? And my question has always been, well, you got to decide if those are the kinds of people that you want to build your life around. You got to decide if right. how much you want to care about those types of people taking you seriously. I mean, do you want to work a job where in order in order to get along with people, you have to be code switching all the time? Do you want to work right. a job where if you decide you want to grow out of Afro, you got to worry about getting fired? And we're now starting to have discussions where employees and workers are starting to realize the value they bring to the table. And we're no longer approaching our jobs with this sort of like 
servant mindset where they have all the power. It's like, no, like I have the power to decide where I work and I may have to pay some costs. I may have to make some sacrifices, but man, I'm not about to build my life around being afraid of how I'm going to wear my hair as a basis for keeping my job. And so I, I love to hear your part of that story. And I love to hear more people starting to talk like that. And I think eventually it's going to take off and we're going to see more and more of that kind of freedom. Yeah. Um, Something though that you did say that I, I, I just want people to know it is, it is a sacrifice uh, because obviously these systems yeah. are in place um, and they make money. That's why nobody really wants to change them. Like the publishing industry honestly makes no sense why they still do things the way they do with Amazon and the fact that you can go direct to customer, the record labels, it doesn't make any sense, but they're in, they're in place because they still make these people a lot of money. So you, you, you may lose things on the front end, but you know, the, the, the true thing is ownership that you own, you know, yourself your content, whatever it is that you want to create, you own that and you can set that that price on it. So if you think your book is worth a hundred dollars, it's worth a hundred dollars. And if you can get somebody to pay that, more power to you. So I think it's, it's, it's definitely a sacrifice. Don't get that twisted. Um, but the end result is ownership, which is something that all of us need to, to have. Yeah, that, that's a really good point because it's, it's not a matter of, hey, can I do things the way I want to do them? It's more a matter of, am I willing to pay the price of, okay. of being who I want to be? So if I'm comfortable walking away, like if I, I can say I, I charge a hundred dollars for my book. And if I'm comfortable with the risk that I'm going to sell fewer copies, or maybe nobody but my mom <laughs> buys that book, right. you know, I still get to call the, call the shots, but uh, I, right. I like how you put that. I, I, I want to go to this other tweet. You wrote a, a tweet thread that I thought was pretty interesting. I, I'll just show the first tweet. And uh, you said some interesting things about um, virtual reality that I kind of want to hear you riff on for a little bit. So let me let me read this tweet here. Um, As a black author, I believe that it's my job to not only entertain, but also tell stories of our history and experiences. I had this idea for a while now about what a modern day Tuskegee experiment might look like. And for me, that answer lied in virtual reality. If you can give our audience, for those who don't know, just a brief little summation of the Tuskegee experiment and what it is you're talking about in this tweet. Yeah, so um, if you don't know, the Tuskegee experiment was a, a 40 year experiment between 1932 and 1972, which is kind of crazy that it wasn't that long ago. Uh, and essentially, um, I believe it's the, the United Health Department um, promised uh, black men in Tuskegee, Alabama, that they would cure them uh, of this disease that, <clears throat> that no one knew truly what it was. Um, they also promised that they would provide health care to people that were coming back from the war or just people that, you know, never had health care. So they, they promised those two things. Um, what they did was the, over the next 40 years was conduct experiment, experiments on what happens if you give someone syphilis without a cure. Uh, and in 1945, the cure for syphilis was invented. Uh, it's penicillin or found. Um, so they had the ability to, to cure these people, but they wanted to see what happens if you give someone this disease and never cure them. Um, so they worked with local uh, health facilities. Um, unfortunately, at the time, Black people can only go to Black uh, doctors and physicians, and they essentially paid them to not treat these people on this list, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, but for 40 years, they did this experiment until someone finally uh, shouted out like, hey, there's some illegal things going on. Um, and I, I believe a couple hundred men had uh, syphilis or got syphilis. They pass it on to their children and their wives. Um, and it kind of was just like, all right, we're done, closed up shop, and that was it. So I thought to myself, well, if you can entice someone with the ability for free healthcare, the ability to potentially have a, have a better life because uh, that's what they were offering, what if in virtual reality, that thing is the same thing? And on the surface, mm -hmm. for people that, you know, can't leave their house or are immobile or people that maybe are paralyzed or people that have health problems that 
can't uh, truly, you know, live a full functioning life, video games is the answer uh, to a lot of people of being able to explore a different life. Uh, you know, games like Second Life or The Sims or just things like Fortnite um, is that answer to for them to make friends, to experience the things that we as able-bodied people are able to experience every single day and take for granted. And reality is soon going to make the playing field equal because in that world, you can be whatever you want to be. If you want to be a flying zombie, you can be that. If you are a man in the real world and want to be a woman, in this world, you can be that. And I think the lines will begin to blur of what's considered reality and what's considered virtual reality. However, with that, there are going to be players in this game uh, that see it as an easy way to do X, Y, and Z. It always happens. Um, and I don't think in their mind they see it as something evil. They're like, well, this is going to be better for people. We're finding, I don't know, a cure for a sickness. But I don't need to tell them because they brought this device and they played this game and they're willingly going to give their bodies and minds to this experiment because this is what they want to do. They want to get healthier. So I think that's how it may start, something that's innocent. And we've seen it with Facebook. We've seen it with Google. Their whole thing is we want to better your life. However, we have all this data on you that we're now selling off, we're trading, uh, and you don't own any of that data because this platform is free. We own you. Um, so I, I truly believe virtual reality is like that next wave. Um, and there are going to be things that we don't know are happening to us. Um, hopefully we put some type of rules and regulations in place to control our data, which will now be our, our physical conscious minds. Chris, it's a little, little deep. This whole, this whole thing about, about owning your data, it, it's actually a, a big interest of mine. I'm really into um, the, the use of the blockchain as as a data storage system, as a way of giving people control and ownership over their own data. And I think that's a, a revolutionary um, idea. But right. when I talk to people about this topic, I find that most people neither know or care about the right. implications of that. It, it's, it's really hard to imagine, right? So we know that we go on Facebook for free. We know that we use Google for free and people can tell us, yeah, they, they take your data and they sell it to advertisers and they use it for this and that, but we don't experience that in a way that's immediately harmful or, you know, as, as being game changing in any way. Can you break down for a minute what the implications of who owns the data about you, what you buy? what you what you watch what you're listening to why should anyone care about that just being owned by google and not by me right um so i i, I think the biggest thing one is um until recently most of these companies can sell your data to police forces to the fbi thanks to the patriot laws um you have no say in that um and police forces would often buy data to identify people because who has the best facial recognition system in the world? Facebook does. We gave it to them. Um, so they would buy data from them. And if they are subpoenaed by the government, they have to give it up. So I think one, that's the biggest thing is police forces can actively do this and put you in a database that either, even if you didn't create or commit a crime, um, you're in. Um, I don't think it has gotten to this level yet, but I could be wrong. But facial recognition is not 100% accurate. So a lot of us have a similar face structure. And if you think mistaken identity when you're walking down the street, you fit the profile is crazy. Imagine if a computer system is running an algorithm and be like, well, these five people fit this profile. Go get all of them. That's, that's one example. Um, uh, a more realistic example of where we are right now is the political field, right? Um, so I don't know if anyone has ever uh, heard of Cambridge Analytics, um, but a few years ago, they blew up and it kind of exposed Facebook for what it was on, on underneath. And I think that topic kind of got brushed underneath everything because no one understands data. But imagine that you take a survey on Facebook that says you enjoy tacos. You also enjoy tacos while watching Narcos. This company was saying, all right, we're going to take that information. And because you like those two things, 
you must love Hispanic people. But because you watch Narcos, you don't like bad Hispanic people. Now, we want to get this political message across that illegal aliens, though they make good tacos, there are a lot of bad Hispanic people that are coming from Hispanic countries. We are going to show you ads to help change your mind about how you feel about these people. And if you continually see something every day, subconsciously you'll be like, well, Hispanic people, they're all, they're rapists. All these people that they're sending, they're bad people. I would never let my daughter date a Hispanic man, or I would never listen to Hispanic music. And before you know it, you have formed this opinion about something that's completely inaccurate or that mm. was shaped and skewed for you to feel that way. So when you go to vote or when you go to express your opinion on social media, this is what you're saying, or you're beginning to find people that also think this way. So uh, that's like a more realistic example without using our current political climate. Uh, but this data, your data can help skew and shape your mind about ideas that are factual or provide you information that may not be 100% accurate. And because you believe Facebook or Google does its job and sources all this information and says, this is wrong, this is right, you're just going to take it at face value because my friend said it or like they ran an ad against me. So it has to be true, right? Someone's paying money to sprout this information out. So that's just like two quick ways. Um, some of the other ways are way more complex, but they can find you because you, you let them um, and they can kind of shape your idea about anything that they want. Man, that <laughs> I love how deep this is getting, right? Like this, <laughs> this is stuff that you don't hear on a daily basis. Um, and I, I, I think people, I think people like need to hear this one. Um, but I think a, a lot of people are interested in, in hearing more things like this. So, you know, kind of tying it back to you, though, on an individual level, I, I know, we're around the same age, Chris, and I think we pretty much grew up in the heyday of manga or of anime, um, where there is uh, new stuff popping up on, you know, on a daily basis, just different series, uh, different sub genres and niche content. And same with video games, right? We grew up in the heyday of video games where all these, um, you know, different video games and, and sub genres and niches are popping up. And, and there's this an entire world that is opening up um, for people who are really interested in that. And it, and it's very appealing to lean into that, especially if the current life you're living isn't a reflection of the things that you want. If the current life you're living it is tough. And I have a lot of friends personally um, who, who are really into like video games and animation and all of that. And, and, and I, you know, at face value, I have no problem with it, but I think, you know, I'd like to hear you speak on how you found the boundaries and how you navigated, um, the, you know, this new world that's opening up. How, how did you kind of ground yourself in the present moment and in reality and, and, you know, how did why did you continue to invest in in life as is right as opposed to kind of going the easier more fun um you know more desirable route uh i mean i'm a i think it's twofold right i don't think we're truly at the level where you well, let me not say that because i know people that play a uh, second life and or half life second life second life um can say like yo this is my life right that's the whole point of the game um is to be able to create the life that you desire uh for me personally um i don't think uh something has enticed me enough to fully like want to commit to like yo that that sounds better than what i believe reality is right now if that comes in the next 10 years this may be a different conversation um but i i think i think right now for me it was um my reality, I think, is more fun than than these virtual realities at the moment. Um, and I, I think because I, I know what my calling is and I found my purpose that's kind of grounded um, of being able to, to talk about this and, and, and blending these worlds that I have in my mind, because honestly, that's where 
that's where I am most of the time is in here and trying to figure out how to bring those stories out uh, to the world. And once I finish that, once I don't feel like writing anymore, sharing these stories, maybe I will transition into that reality um, because there's millions of stories that I couldn't even fathom that are being placed into one tangible thing, one tangible product. And the opportunities are endless, you know? That's the beauty of some of these games is just like, if you do this, this changes the whole whole game. Like, So I, I think for me personally, that technology hasn't gotten there yet. Um, and I don't knock anyone that, you know, does play things or does spend hours on those games. Because one, you can make a lot of money. Uh, you can make a career out of it. Or just your reality is not something that you want to be in. So this is how you find that thing that keeps you sane. Um, so I, I definitely say, hey, that's that's what you enjoy. That's what you like. Keep doing it. However, be mindful of where things are going. Uh, just just kind of be aware of like those terms and conditions that you sign. It ain't for free. Just read, just read it if you want. Um, but yeah, just be mindful. That's all. And then I, I guess my other question um, was, was, you know, you, how do I phrase this? TK, I'm actually going to kick it over to you because I want to phrase this super intentionally before, before I ask it. Oh, this sounds like yeah, a hard one. Right. <laughs> you making Chris nervous over here. <laughs> No, I have I have no doubt about his ability to knock it out of the park, whatever that question is. Well, hey, man, one thing I, I just want to ask, because I got the title here is the power of writing your own story. And I like to sometimes think about life through the lens of, of that metaphor, that we are the authors of our own story. Being someone that's gone from homeless to successful author and who is doing so in a way that's inspiring people, what piece of advice can you give to those who want to experience more power to be the authors of their own narrative. I mean, I like that successful author. I'm not quite there yet where it can be my full-time career, but but we're getting there. Um, but yeah. I honestly would just say, um, find, and I, I, I know this, this is, you know, cache, but find what it is that you like. Um, I think it took, for me, it took a lot of trying this and trying that. Um, before I realized, like, yo, like, I really want to write. Um, and I, I, I'm i thankful for my, my parents, once again, for giving me that space to do that. Because a lot of people would be like, boy, if you don't just figure it out, like, go go do something, like, and stick with it. Um, they allowed me to, yeah. to quit things. Um, if you don't like it, quit. I mean, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, you you saving yourself some time. You saving anybody else some time. Just, just, but try it. And if that's not something you're interested in, like move on to something else. So I, I truly say like, find something you're interested in because the money will come. Once you find passion, it doesn't feel like work. You can just do this all day, you know, I'm up to, as you can see, most of my tweets are two, three, four in the morning. Cause I'm up like enjoying what I'm doing, writing, um, like writing down ideas for stories, watching, you know, shows or TV that may give me inspiration because this is what I want yeah. my career to be. So like one, try as many things as possible until you find something that you enjoy. Uh, and then two, just continue to go at it because in that beginning, it's gonna be tough. You ain't gonna have no views. You're not gonna have no followers. Um, you may get something to go viral. It seems a lot easier now, but like that doesn't guarantee anything happens after that. So like, don't let those highs and lows stop you um, because I guarantee if you get on that other side, you will figure out like, oh, snaps. If I do this, this, and this, I can make $15 off whatever it is that I'm doing. So just keep going. Uh, it'll become more apparent how you can monetize off your passion. And then the third is give back, teach it. I think it's dope to be able to just like, hey, me, 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 gimme, 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 let me get your money, get your tickets. But like invest in someone, mentor someone. You don't have to create a whole course uh, to teach people the skill set, but make sure you give it back to that next generation, that that next you, because uh, there will be somebody that hopefully is better than you and takes that to the next level. And um, I think that's where the true value is. Like when you leave this earth, what are people going to say about you? So those are my my three my three things. Hmm. 
All right, I think I got it now. So it, don't, don't overthink it. Um, I actually right. posted a quote on the Revolution of One Instagram um, yesterday, and it said, it's by Neil deGrasse Tyson, and it goes something like, knowing how to think empowers you far beyond those who only know what to think. And so I think a lot of the discussions that we were having during this live stream was was teaching people um, or, or, or making people at question what they're being told, what is the information they're being fed, um, and not just kind of being shuffled along um, about what to think. And so I, I, I want to ask you, like, how did you train yourself to think? How did you train yourself to ask, uh, you know, these hard questions? Um, what, you know, was it parents? Was it your grandparents? Um, you know, how important is learning how to think versus just thinking what you're told to think? Right. Um, I think it was a mixture of my parents and grandparents and then just like my personality. I, I, when I was a kid, I was that kid that would ask a lot of questions and like people would hate me because I'm just like, well, why is the sky blue? Well, why does that make that sound? And no one would have the answer. Uh, so I just started looking it up myself. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Google guy. Like I Google everything. My girlfriend sometimes gets annoyed because we'll just be driving. And I will, I'd be like, yo, how much do you think it costs? Actually, no, this is a better example. We'll, we'll, we're watching a movie and a song comes on and I'm like, how much does it think it costs to get this song in this in this movie? So every time a song comes on in a movie that is just like, oh, this is a dope song, she looks at me and we knowingly say it. Um, but I always just have been inquisitive. And I think, to, to be honest, there's no uh, reason not to be inquisitive now um, because Google is there, Wikipedia is there, encyclopedia still exists. Um, how to train yourself to do that is I think just not taking the first answer as face value. Um, I think for a lot of people, you know, uh, we're taught to respect our elders, right? That's never going to disrespect anyone. But someone's wisdom is only because of things they went with. So if you ask a hundred thousand dollars and they've never made that, well, their answer is not going to be something I'm going to take at face value. Um, so looking into another a resource or maybe finding someone that has made that or maybe just watching interviews. That's how I got a lot of my, my information um, is, is a cool way. And then just questioning everything. It's not a bad thing. You don't necessarily have to say it out loud to someone, but just mark it in your mind and be like, hmm, let me go look into that. Um, and then the third thing I, I truly believe is just reading, right? Like you don't have to read these leadership books or you don't have to read um, like the newspaper every day. But like there are some like really cool fiction or nonfiction books where they may say something like, oh, like Lu Bu was one of the most dominant uh, Chinese generals in the world. And you're just like, well, who's Lu Bu? And then you Google it and you're just like, whoa, like they conquered all these places. Like, why have I never heard about that? And that then leads you on to researching other things. So I think reading uh, definitely helps. I encourage you to question everything. Uh, don't take it for base, face value. And then three, just look for people that have achieved something or are in a place that you want to be and see what they're saying. Uh, they usually offer like suggestions or things that you should, should read. So. Chris, you, you read a lot. I do. Um, there are a lot of people, Kamau and I encounter, who want to read more. And, and, and we're now living in a world where we're constantly seeing messages like CEOs read one book a week. Some people are like, how yeah. I read a book a day for one year. How do people read more? Because a lot of people are overwhelmed, feel like they need to be reading all the time. What's your thoughts? Right. I think we got to change the mindset of reading. Those things crack me up when it's like uh, this, this CEO reads, you know, 50 books. A month. But it's like, OK, well, what's considered a book now, right? Um, mm. I don't necessarily read as much like leadership books and, and stuff in that regard, but I read a lot of like fiction books because that's like my world I'm in and I can pick up a 25,000 word book and be finished in two hours. That's, that's a book, right? So I, I think it's just changing the perception. Everything doesn't have to uh, enrich you in terms of like, yo, this is going to push my mindset forward because everybody don't live that life you know everybody doesn't need to live that life 
But I think yep. the more you read um, just different things, the more your mind is open to other things. Like, let's say you read, um, I don't know, uh, Twilight. It's a, it's an interesting book to read. But like it, it expand your mind of like, yo, like what if vampires and and werewolves were real? And then that makes you want to read maybe something else of like, what's the history of vampires or what's the history of werewolves? So I think just reading things that you may be interested in will help you to explore other things that you may find interesting. Um, and I think it also makes everyone a lot more like educated uh, in terms of like words to use or enunciations or um, just being understanding that everyone doesn't speak the same. A lot of the authors are doing, you know, own voice. So most of my people speak like they from Philly and you can learn like that kind of slang or you can learn some, some Baltimore slang or some New York slang. Um, so I just think it makes you a more well-rounded person. Don't be, you know, leadership books and, and the news every day to become a better entrepreneur um, or a better human being, I think just consuming other people's words can definitely help. I absolutely love it, man. I absolutely love it. Some of the best advice I ever received was from a theater teacher who said the key to being a better artist is being a better human being. And that doesn't mean reading books about art all the time. It just means reading anything yeah. you enjoy that makes you better as a person, you know? Yeah. Where can people find I, mean, I don't I was, Sorry, I was, this is my last ahead. note. Real, for real, like some of my life lessons, I don't want to make it sound like I was a, a lame in high school, but I wasn't the most popular kid. So like Naruto for me taught me like how to believe in yourself, how to stand up for yourself, um, how to be compassionate when people don't like you. And no one didn't like me. I was a funny guy, but like I wasn't popular. I didn't have like the most friends. So I truly took some of those life lessons and I would think to myself, what would Naruto do? Or what would Rock Lee do? And it sounds funny and cheesy, but like for some people, you really need that to, to get through the day or get, get life going. So I, I agree with you. It does make you a better human being. Um, but uh, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook at It's Chris Coleman. Um, if you're on TikTok, I'm Chris Coleman. I, I sometimes get on there and do the whip and nay nay with the kids. <laughs> um, but yeah, mostly on Twitter and Instagram. <laughs> I, yeah, the, the dances they do nowadays, I'm just like, I can't do this, man. It, I need, I need a whole dance instructor to teach me like all the, all the things. It's too much for me, man. It's too much, hey, bro. I'm, I'm so mad that I'm just finding out about your TikTok because I would have definitely played a couple of clips if I knew about it. You know, <laughs> I got some things on there that I'm just like, eh, eh whatever. It's, <laughs> it's there. It's fine. <laughs> hey, Chris, man, oh, thanks oh. for taking the time to tell your story, man. Thank you, man. I forgot. Uh, if you want to find my books, you can go on Amazon, type in Chris Coleman, uh, and you'll, you'll see some of my work. So look out. I, I usually try to release a book a week. Um, so, yeah. Hey, so so they out here talking about reading a book a week, you writing a book a week. Yeah, yeah. So we we doing it, man. We doing it. <laughs> Coleman's, man. Coleman's, brother. Take it over the world. Peace out, Chris. For everybody who is viewing, we will be back Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 12 p.m. Eastern time. Don't forget to tune in. It's going to be sublime. Next week, we've got author Jeff Goins the author of uh, The Myth of the Starving Artist, or Real Artists Don't Starve. And he's gonna talk about how you can transcend that mindset of like, oh, in order to be an artist, I gotta be broke all the time. How you can create from an abundance mindset. Don't forget to tune in. That's next Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, be sure to follow Chris and check out some of the amazing, awesome books. Take care, everybody. <laughs>